Um, again, my name is Jeff Felice, and I serve as the president of CertNexus. If you're not familiar with CertNexus, we're a global certification body, and we provide better emerging, uh, emerging technology certifications and micro credentials. So, for example, the AI biz course we're delivering today, that leads to a micro credential, um, so a knowledge base assessment. And then, as Marcus was alluding to, if someone wants to go on to a technical certification, a more technical certification, skills based, hands on, how, to be, how do I become a machine learning engineer uh, certification, which is our certified AI practitioner, um, that would um, is a, a more intensive course leading to a uh, technical certification. Uh, our, our certifications are globally recognized, uh, so I, I won't spend a lot of time here. We've, um, it, uh, with partners like Fastlane, have uh, certified candidates in over 50 countries around the world to date. Um, and these are uh, some companies, uh, some that will be recognizable to you. Again, I think what we really want to take away from here is that uh, these technologies are being used across every industry sector to date. So, Again, I'm going to turn off my video just to help with bandwidth um, at this point in time. I'll turn it back on um, at, uh, at the end as well, um, but really want the focus to be on the, the slides and, and not my face. Um, so, again, I want to thank everyone for taking the time today and we have um, booked uh, from 2 to uh, half past 4. Um, and so uh, the content will take up the majority of that time. Um, but do want to allow for any uh, questions along the way as well. Um, so if you do have any questions, just type um, in the chat field and um, I'll answer those questions as we go along. So again, the agenda, we're going to start by talking about the growth of artificial intelligence. That some of this may be familiar to you, but one of, uh, for those that it's not, we want to make sure that they have this foundational information. Again, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence impact on jobs and share some statistics and, and other uh, trending information with you. And then again, we're going to spend the majority of our time today with, for AI for business professionals or with AI biz, where we're actually learning about the uh, technology, at least from a conceptual perspective. So uh, let's talk about the, the growth of artificial intelligence. Uh, it, if, and we'll learn a little more about the history of it and as we start the AI biz class, but. Although uh, modern artificial intelligence has been around for 70 years, it's really been the last five years where it's been embraced by both governments and private industry, and it's starting to become our, our everyday lives. Um, and you think, well, how often do I use artificial intelligence? And you use it probably more than you think. Um, every time you use your smartphone, right, your smartphones contain art artificial intelligence. Every time you perform a Google search, uh, you're using artificial intelligence. Many times when you're, uh, if you're engaging with a, a streaming service like Netflix, they're using artificial intelligence. Uh, if you are, um, you know, on a e-commerce website, many times it's using artificial intelligence. So there's been this huge proliferation of the use of artificial intelligence in our everyday personal and business lives. And these initiatives are expanding rapidly and they're expanding both um, from a nation state perspective where uh, governments are investing in artificial intelligence along with private industry and um, in our uh, public education institution, uh, public and private education institutions as well. So again, we'll learn more about the history of this, but I think what we need to know is that it, it, although artificial intelligence is in a, an emerging technology, it's widely used today and an emerging technology is really one that just hasn't reached its full potential. So it's not artificial intelligence isn't just something for um, you know, the movie industry any longer, right? It's not like we're going to go see iRobot or whatever, just have to see artificial intelligence. We interact with it every day, but the potential for it is still uh, quite, quite um, dramatic. Um, global spending on uh, AI systems are uh, growing rapidly. Um, I, I, I brought in this statistic, I, I think most of you are based in Germany or, or nearby. Um, and so not, even if not in Germany, um, in any other country in the EU or beyond, there's been a huge investment in artificial intelligence. A lot of, a, a number in startups um, in private industry. Some of those are actually spin outs from um, research institutions. 
Um, and what we've seen is a lot of them are um, focused not just on our, our, our personal uh, habits, you know, such as home assistance and smartphones and wearables, et cetera, but also now with a B2B focus as well. So a huge um, amount of uh, uh, investment in research and development in how to enable AI to better facilitate uh, companies, um, processes, decision-making, and the growth of their business. And as I shared, it's a huge focus in Germany. Um, I, I, you, you may or may not be aware, but there's a, a national strategy uh, that Germany has um, put in place. Um, if, if you haven't read it, um, uh, it, it you, you can probably um, Google it and at least get an overview of it. But what's interesting is, is that, that most nations are now putting a strategy in place um, because for several reasons, one is that we're, um, we're using this to, um, in our governments to provide better services. Uh, we're also using it uh, to better protect our, our, co uh, countries, um, especially against state actors when we talk about cybersecurity. Um, but we're also doing it to advance our economies. Um, and so, uh, much like, uh, nations have invested in other, what we call, you know, critical infrastructure, like electricity and, and water, um, et cetera, we're now seeing, starting to see artificial intelligence is becoming part of one of those um, points of critical infrastructure for our nation states. And with this data ethics is on the rise as well. Um, and again, um, as many countries that are investing in AI are starting to realize for the first time, we're giving the machines the power to make decisions. Um, as we'll learn more about uh, machine learning and deep learning, machines now have the ability to make human-like decisions, but they don't understand the ethical norms that most of us prescribe to globally. And so, what we're attempting, what we need to do now, is ensure that we regulate um, artificial intelligence while still allowing for innovation. We need to regulate it so it doesn't cause harm to any uh, groups of groups of people or individuals. Um, and it's much like what we, um, you know, the EU has done with GDPR. I wish I could say the same for me. I'm sitting in the, the, the U.S. We still lack a, a, a national um, a pri data privacy regulation. Um, so, um, but it's, it's so much like what we've done with GDPR, and, and and that continues to be refined. There will be something similar for we expect for that in regards to data or AI ethics as well. And you can see that over 300 AI policy initiatives from over 60 countries, again, um, although we see a huge investment from private industry, especially from not only from big tech, but in finance, manufacturing, healthcare, et cetera. We also are seeing um, in many of these nation states, again, starting to um, both provide strategies, but also how to best um, employ uh, AI in a, in a meaningful, but yet um, ethical way. So that's just a high level background on artificial intelligence. As we move into the course, we'll better define what artificial intelligence is and look um, more at the history as well. But wanted to give you at least a high level view of the fact that, hey, artificial intelligence, it's something that we're all engaged with today. Um, it's still an emerging technology, meaning that it still has huge potential for growth. Um, and then again, it's being invested in um, by governments, by private sector and our universities um, and other uh, private, uh, public entities as well. So let's talk about some of the impact on jobs. I think there's a fear um, it's, we're, we're going to be replaced by machines. And I use the analogy of other previous um, significant uh, uh, technologies that have shifted the workplace. Um, and, you know, we can go back to um, electricity, right? And what electricity did, right? It brought more people into cities. Um, it actually um, brought about more manufacturing. Now, whether this is good or bad, this is what, what occurred. So if I, you know, if we were to have this conversation and had this technology a hundred years ago, and I said, how many of us are involved in agriculture or our families? The majority of uh, would, us would raise our hands. If I said 50 years ago, how many of us are involved in manufacturing Again, the majority of us would raise our hands. If I ask the question today, the majority of us are going to say, hey, we are involved in, in using technology. 
right? So we've seen these major shifts and we're gonna see this shift with artificial intelligence as well. What, what we expect to happen is that, is, is, um, that we'll in, that again, some jobs will move towards obsolescence and we'll look at that on the next slide. But the reality is for the most part, we're gonna start working um, more in tandem with machines. So uh, whether in a physical environment, like we're looking at here, this is an Amazon uh, distribution warehouse where an individual is actually picking items off the shelf, putting it on a robot, and that robot then takes that um, down an aisle um, to someone else that will then pack it to ship it. So um, that's the reality is what they've done is they said, hey, robots are um, two things on with the robots. One is um, they move more consistently up and uh, up and down. Um, and if we have to, um, and also more safely, right? So if they have to encounter forklifts, et cetera, we're not putting people um, in, in harm's way. So that's the reality in the physical environment, but also in our in our um, business or workplace environments where we're not engaged with you know physical uh, machines. Um, it's going to be the same way. We're going to see AI automate a number of processes for us, but there's still going to be other work, probably higher level cognitive work that we'll actually be working on. And so, and we see that in this graphic here from McKinsey. If you're not familiar with McKinsey, they're a large um, global uh, consulting firm. And what they say is that about 60% of occup occupations will have 30% of their activities that are automatable. Um, so that means, and you think about that, and that's continued to happen, right? Um, I've been in the workplace long enough where um, some of the things that I used to do, whether it was data entry or processing of data, et cetera, is now automated. Um, we have middleware solutions that, you know, uh, automated e-commerce solutions, automated financials, et cetera, that we're, we spend less time, time computing that and more time actually um, receiving that information and, 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 and analyzing it. So what we're gonna see is that, um, as we'll see down the next screen, some jobs will move towards obsolescence. There'll be many new jobs but for the most of us, our jobs are just some of the tasks that we do are going to change. But as I alluded to, the reality is there will be some jobs where we're going to see growth and others where we're going to see decreasing demand. So on the left hand side, you can see the World Economic Forum predicts there will be 97 million new jobs from the data and AI, data and AI economy. At the same time, they expect millions to move towards obsolescence. Um, so we're going to have fewer data entry clerks. Uh, we're going to have potentially fewer accountants as we can automate some of those uh, more rote, repeatable tasks. Um, and maybe not accountants, but maybe bookkeepers or people that are doing the other, um, again, uh, more repeatable tasks. We've seen this in our factories uh, where we have now robotics um, and other automation that we've brought to our manufacturing and this in assembly of, of goods and products. Um, but again, there's going to be many more new jobs in data, such as data analysts and data scientists and AI and machine learning developers and engineers. Um, those are involved with information security or cybersecurity, um, IoT, the, at the Internet of Things, et cetera. So the fact is, is that we're going to have more new jobs than we will see those jobs move towards obsolescence. And again, for the majority of us, our jobs are going to change. And the fact is, is we're not ready. Um, a, a Deloitte Global Human Capital study showed that two thirds of leaders said that our workforce isn't um, ready for um, the changes that we're seeing due to these emerging technologies like artificial intelligence. And the, the challenge is, is that we are not producing enough um, people through our education systems to, um, to be able to meet this need. So um, much like what you're probably here, hopefully yourselves today, and we'll talk more about that, but is, is we need to continue through a lifelong, lifelong learning experience is um, essentially have people that are gonna uh, change careers or advance their existing career. So maybe from go, um, uh, going from becoming a programmer to an AI uh, developer, or machine learning engineer, um, going from someone that's a um, an analyst, a financial analyst, maybe to a uh, data scientist, um, et cetera. So we're gonna see that continued growth in those areas in our skills and knowledge um, because again, we don't have enough 
um, young people um, or people that have gone back to, to university or other um, extended uh, uh, training programs or educational programs to meet that need. And so we're seeing again, um, this is a Gartner survey that just reinforces what we saw from the Deloitte survey, which is that again, there's a widening skills gap. And again, this is across the many emerging technologies, you know, some of them, not only artificial intelligence, but data science, uh, the internet of things, cybersecurity, um, emerging uh, fields like AI and data ethics and many more. And so, again, these skills are, are needed. Um, so if you're here because you're looking to advance your skills or you're looking to um, uh, potentially uh, looking for your team, um, your broader team, the fact is, is that we're seeing that there's two challenges we have at the, at the um, leader level in a business. Um, we're lacking the foundational knowledge we need to understand how a technology like artificial intelligence can be beneficial to our organization. Um, and then at the technical level, we're lacking professionals that can implement AI and other data driven projects. Um, so really we were seeing the need at both ends of this, uh, the continuum from a knowledge and from a uh, technical or skills based perspective to be able to advance our uh, AI projects. Um, and so this is something again where we're seeing significant investments um, and obviously you know each of you are here today um, doing this doing this for yourselves and, and hopefully for um, your extended if, if, if responsible for extended teams as well um, and as I mentioned there's a growing skills gap in tech ethics um, a number of organizations say how ethics um, specifically are, are important to the organization but most aren't ready to address the trend um, so the fact is, is that we're developing these technologies and these technologies are making decisions in some cases, in some cases regarding to how we police people or whether we provide them with um, home or auto loans or whether we um, give someone the opportunity for a job. We're using an AI in all of those processes um, at, some, at, at some level. And again, we need to ensure that those algorithms that are making those decisions are ethical and again, um, being and providing us the ability to provide responsible technologies to make responsible decisions. So that that is again just a brief overview of you know, um, where we are with AI and its impact on um, artificial intelligence. Um, and now we're going to um, I'm going to uh, uh, actually share another screen here. Um, so I'm going to um, stop sharing for a second. Just a this. If there's any questions, um, please feel free to put those in the Q&A. I'm going to have a few polls as we get into this uh, next um, section here where we'll uh, chat with one another. Um, let me just bring this up. And we'll share the screen again. Great. So, uh, again, this is uh, the CERT Nexus uh, knowledge based program for artificial intelligence called AI for business professionals or commonly referred to as AI biz. And in AI biz, what we're going to discuss over the next couple of hours is the fundamentals of AI. How AI is implemented from a conceptual perspective. So we'll talk about search engines and robotics, et cetera, from a conceptual perspective, and so okay, how AI is used, and then the impact of AI. So what are some of the benefits and some of the challenges? And then look at from an industry perspective, how AI is being used at a high level today. So I wanna get started by um, asking you a question. Um, so, and, and if you can just type in the chat, and so the answers, you can just type one, two, three, four, or five. But I want to understand what's your primary objective for attending this training session? Are you involved in making technologies decisions for your company and need to know more about AI? Um, are, are you expected to be uh, expect uh, to in the future manage an AI or machine learning projects or your project or product manager or program manager? Um, what, did your supervisor thought think this would be useful to you? Are you considering a career change and think um, this would help you as you pursue other opportunities? Or are you generally just curious about technology and want to learn more about um, AI? 
So if you can just put that in the chat window. Um, and uh, we'll look at uh, those responses. Just again, give us an understanding of uh, your interest in this and, and uh, over the next, well, and that way I can better talent tailor the uh, experience for everyone here. Is everyone able to type in the chat window? Ah, uh, here we go. Great, we're getting some answers starting to roll in. Great, and I'm starting to see really uh, so uh, some fives here. That's great. Um, good. So so there's a general curiosity. That's great, and and, and we'll see that most of, with a lot of people. There's uh, curiosity, and that may lead to um, some of the other uh, uh, answers in the future as well. So. Uh, Thank you uh, for participating in that poll and we'll move on now to the uh, next section. So we're gonna start with uh, artificial intelligence concepts. So what is artificial intelligence? If we really distill it down, artificial intelligence or AI is the ability of machines to exhibit human-like intelligence. So really it's being able to essentially make decisions like humans would and completes um, some basic tasks that we would as humans. So the first thing that we under, need to understand, though, is that machines don't do not have intelligence, right? We're using a sentient being. Um, typically, when we talk about human beings, um, the word intelligence, but other living beings can have intelligence as well. But machines don't have intelligence. We're prescribing that to machines. What machines have is our algorithms. And for the first time, these algorithms are able to start um, to actually display or, or complete tasks or make decisions that humans would be able to without direct human involvement. So artificial intelligence is really this, this uh, umbrella concept where we say, hey, these technologies are able to do things that humans, it's essentially to make decisions that humans can, can make. And that's really the, the the definition of artificial intelligence. If we look at the history of artificial intelligence, and again, this is the modern history. Some will argue that the history of art artificial intelligence um, precedes 1950 and the Turing test out of the UK, but this is fundamentally agreed upon as the modern era of, of AI. So it did start uh, with Alan Turing um, in, uh, in 1950 in the Turing test. And this was really the ability for us to measure, can a computer make a, de a decision um, that a, a human could? Um, in 1956, the, the actual term artificial intelligence or AI was coined at Dartmouth College um, out, out of the United States. Uh, we had a, a few initial investments um, in artificial intelligence. Unimate was a good example where it was a robotic arm um, on an auto, auto uh, manufacturing uh, floor. Um, and a couple other investments, um, including Shaky, which is a more multi-purpose uh, robot. And then there was a paper that came out in the early 1970s out of the UK that said, listen, we'd really, um, AI, we're not going to realize the potential of AI. Um, these investments, although uh, to date of, of interest, really haven't proved to be beneficial. And so, unlike many other technologies that where we see a continued progression, that really for um, about 20 years, we saw little investment in AI, and it was resulting from this paper. We saw a, a, a in the mid the mid 80s, we started to see some investment again, but then that was um, in equity called expert systems, which were able to do one thing really really well. But that was soon supplanted by the personal computer, and we moved into our second AI winner. So during these periods, we saw a little investment. There was some in research institutions, et cetera, but again, minimal. Um, and that all changed in the mid 90s um, as IBM re released Deep Blue. And Deep Blue, um, if, if you're familiar, was um, is infamous for being able to beat uh, the Grand Master uh, Chess Champion Gary Kasparov in, in, in games of chess. And that really started to incite again interest in uh, artificial intelligence and started to bring investment um, it, along with it. Um, so we saw some other, I would say, um, you know, non-commercial uses of it um, in 
Kismet, uh, which again was um, did some um, basic um, robotics and in, 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 in speech. Um, the grand challenge, which was um, essentially the ability uh, for uh, autonomous vehicles to attempt to circum circumvent a um, a track. Um, uh, in the first year, none were able to do it. In the second year, several were able to do it. Um, but again, these were um, really kind of oddities, right? It wasn't, again, a, a specific application of this. And then in 2011, a little over 10 years ago, when was where we started to see the commercial application of artificial intelligence. Um, IBM supplanted Deep Blue with Watson. And then we also saw Apple release Siri. Now, the first iterations of Siri was not artificial intelligence. It was just some really complex algorithms, but soon was supplanted by um, our artificial intelligence and the way we engage with um, uh, Siri and, and other uh, technologies like it today. The majority of that is backed by artificial intelligence. And then in uh, 2016, Google released DeepMind. Uh, DeepMind was able to be um, the Go champion, uh, which is a really complex board game, um, and so uh, so and and be able to do that, which was um, again showed the the potential for artificial intelligence. And as I shared earlier, since 2016, and even a little bit prior to that, we've seen significant investment in artificial intelligence. Um, again, we most of it um, we. It, um, it's originated within research institutions and big tech, but now we're seeing its proliferation across all industry. So we're going to learn a little bit about machine learning and deep learning, but before we do, we want to talk about how these uh, concepts relate. So artificial intelligence, again, is this umbrella concept um, that um, essentially when we talk about autonomous technologies, we, we talk about artificial intelligence or AI. The, the types of AI that are most often used are machine learning and then deep learning and deep learning being a subset of machine learning, although some will say it's now becoming its own type of artificial intelligence. Um, so that's how these, these, con these relate. There's artificial intelligence, this umbrella concept, but when we go to deploy or employ um, artificial intelligence, we're typically doing it through machine learning or deep learning. But what is machine learning? How does this differentiate from applications that we you have used traditionally? Well, uh, first off is that if you're uh, familiar with traditional programming, we use algorithms in tra traditional program, right? But the difference is with traditional programming is, and I'm going to oversimplify this, but it's really a series of nested if-then statements, right? So if I select a cell in Excel, it bolts. If I type one, two, three, one, two, three displays, right? It's if, then, right? If I do this, then do that. Um, what's different about uh, artificial intelligence is the algorithms actually are trained. So what we do is we take an initial uh, set of data calling, called our training data, and we actually input that to, into the algorithm. And the algorithm makes predictions. And then what it does is it evaluates those predictions. And then it will learn from them and it will improve the algorithm. So the, the algorithm is not static. It is continuously learning. So even as you put more data into it beyond your training data, it will continue to make additional predictions, will again evaluate, learn, and improve the algorithm. So over time, your algorithm should get smarter and make better predictions. Again, it's all dependent on the data and we'll learn more about that. But that's how really a, when we talk about AI algorithms, they're not just doing what we told it to do, those nested if then statements. We, we are providing some guidance, especially at the machine learning level, less so at the deep learning as we'll learn. But we're allowing the algorithm to make those predictions. We're not telling it exactly what to do. With deep learning, is we we actually um, we do much like we uh, it's similar to machine learning in that the algorithm is making predictions, but it's doing it in a layered format. So this is an example where we're taking an image, we input it into um, our as we'll learn an artificial neural network, which is um, uh, we use in deep learning, and 
that in those layers at the at the lowest layer, it's going to say, "Hey, this image is made up of shapes. It's made up of a crescent moon, a triangle, a, a rhombus, an ellipsis." And that's going to say, "Hey, these look like components of a face. It's a mouth. It's eyes. It's a nose. It's an ears." And then it's going to assemble that information, and then it's going to predict correctly in this case that this is a human face. So. Um, machine learning is, again, makes those same predictions, but as we'll learn, machine learning does this in a uh, less complex manner and typically with more guidance from humans, where deep learning is we're really relying on the algorithm itself to essentially determine some of the information and that it's receiving as well as make the prediction itself. So. When do we use machine learning versus deep learning? And again, we'll learn more about the, the various approaches to each of these. But when we when we look at, hey, when would we use uh, machine learning versus deep learning to solve a business problem or you know in a wearable device or in our smartphones, et cetera, we look at um, the amount of data we have. So the more data we have, the more likely we might lean towards deep learning. And deep learning requires a lot of data. Machine learning, we can get by with less data. So it may be that, hey, we just don't have a lot of data. And at this point in time, so machine learning is our best solution. We'll learn more about cl what classification is, but essentially that's where we're assisting um, the, uh, the algorithm in classifying um, or, or, or identifying the information that we're used to train it. And with machine learning, we provide some information, what we call features, and we'll talk more about that for classification. With and where the deep learning, the algorithm does itself. So it's again what we see with the deep learning, it's more hands-off. We're allowing the algorithm to assess more more about the data that we're providing it to it and making decisions about the data itself. An algorithm and, and machine learning typically makes a guided prediction. Again, we're assisting it along the way. For deep learning, it's unguided. We're letting the deep learning algorithm really determine, again, not only with the, the data and how to classify it, but also make a more unguided prediction. And machine learning, although we can use it to really solve complex problems, it's less complex than solving the most complex problems that we use in deep learning, such as natural language processing or computer vision, or really, um, again, some more advanced um, types of uh, algorithmic predictions um, such as those. So um, the choice um, when, when you know, choosing between machine learning and deep learning, it really comes down to how much data do you have available? How much do you know about that data? And how much do you want the uh, algorithm to predict the outcome? And so in traditional machine learning, we can see we use this uh, when analyzing patient health records, uh, we will, and we'll talk more about this, but looking bank, bank account activity, whether there's fraudulent activity, uh, customer surveys and other examples. And with deep learning, we're using this, and again, our most complex um, um, algorithmic um, predictions and, and capabilities today. So again, in computer vision, when we talk about um, autonomous vehicles, um, the natural language processing, right? The ability to understand and generate human speech, much like we do um, with our uh, our smartphones or our home assistants, uh, whether that's Alexa, Alexa or Google Home Assistants or others as well. So just a, a, a quick uh, check on, on, on knowledge here. Um, what learning model would be most appropriate if you have smaller data and uh, that, that are well structured and you know the intended outcome. So is it artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, or natural language processing? And again, you can just uh, type in the chat window, one, two, three, or four. Great, and we're getting some answers rolling in here. I'll wait just another second. And the correct answer is two, which is machine learning. Great job. Again, artificial intelligence is that umbrella concept. Machine learning is again when we typically have um, smaller data sets, 
we know more about that data and it will guide the, the um, uh, predictive outcome. Deep learning is, again, more unguided with more data. And natural language processing, as we'll learn, is a type of deep learning. Great job. So now that we've defined artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning, we're going to talk about the approaches to machine learning and deep learning. So go one layer uh, deeper here. So machine learning, we have three, three um, uh, primary approaches, there's others as well, but it's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So we're going to dig, dig a little bit deeper into each one of these. So su supervised learning is an approach to machine learning where we know more about the data. So we know um, the, what we'll call the features, which are the measurable properties, and we also understand what the, the, um, the output could be um, and provide some guidance on that. So we're going to look at an example on the next screen of uh, medical records. But before doing so, we want to um, define uh, three uh, components. One is the example. So this is an individual instance of data. So for example, each one of us as a patient in our um, healthcare systems is an example. Um, we, each of us have measurable properties, right? In this case, in, in healthcare, I mean, you'll see on the next screen, we each have measurable properties being height, weight, and our blood pressure. And then we have a variable that we're trying to predict. And so what we do is, again, we're going to use this data to help train the algorithm to be able to help make predict predictions regarding the, the number of features that we're providing to it. So what does this look like? So you can see in this case, we have the examples. We have, um, it, it, we're using uh, patient IDs, right? We would not use their names. Um, so we're using IDs. And each one of these patients, again, they have measurable features or measurable properties, which are their weight, their height, and their blood pressure. And then what we're doing is we're labeling, at least in our training set of data, we're labeling whether they have heart disease. So um, you can see patient one doesn't, two does, and so on. So we're assembling this data, and then what we do is we take this data and we run this training data through the algorithm. So we're telling in this first instance with the training data, we're saying to the algorithm, these individuals with this height, this weight, and this blood pressure, they do or don't have heart disease. And the algorithm starts to learn and classify that information. So now what we can take is all of our new data which is unlabeled. So we still have the example, right, which is the patient. We have the measurable properties, right, which is those features. So they still have height, weight, and blood pressure, but we're not saying whether they have heart disease or not. And the algorithm, based on the, the information we've trained it with before, we, we will be able to predict whether someone has heart disease or not. That's the label, right? Do they have heart disease? In this case, it's binary, yes or no. And so the, the, in the supervised learning process, the algorithm is able to predict that based on information. Now, again, you typically would use large sample sizes to train. And then again, the new data to flow through would be again, even larger yet. Um, but again, we're using this today in healthcare. And again, many other places we're using a healthcare example here to predict an outcome. And unsupervised, it's very much like supervised that, we, again, we still have uh, uh, individual instances of data. Uh, we have measurable properties, but we're not, we don't have a label. So, and we're allowing the algorithm to provide that label. So we're not determining whether we have heart disease or not. Um, in this case, what we do is we have unlabeled input. So in, in this case, instead of using height, weight, um, and blood pressure, we're using uh, diet and uh, how active someone is. So someone could have a poor diet or a, a, an optimal diet, um, or they could be sedent they could be and they could be sedentary or active. And we input that into the algorithm, and the algorithm starts to learn. And now they start to cluster like examples. So people that have uh, less optimal diets and sedentary, they're going to start to put together as opposed to those people that have more optimal diets and are more active. So again, we're not determining yet, do they have, um, 
heart disease, but we're starting to cluster, and this is what we call a, a clustering algorithm, starting to cluster like examples together, and then we can start to make inferences from there as well. Reinforcement learning is, is a different type of uh, machine learning in that, um, in, in the way that it operates. Um, and this is used in uh, gaming and robotics. Um, we're now starting to use reinforcement learning along with some uh, deep learning as well uh, to accelerate some of the learning within deep learning. But reinforcement learning as a, a, a standalone uh, approach within machine learning um, is where we essentially will uh, select an action. In this case, we're playing a game of chess. So the first thing we're gonna do is select a chess piece. We select a pawn. We then uh, move that pawn. In this case, we're uh, moving it two spaces forward. And then the, there's an assessment, right, uh, of ha what happens. Was that, um, did that move, did that strengthen my position? Did it weaken my position? Was, this pawn, was the pawn captured? Um, did it actually put potentially uh, another um, one of the white pieces um, in, uh, in line of sight to be captured, um, et cetera? And a reward is given. And then the process repeats over and over. And this is how IBM trained Deep Blue to beat Gary Kasparov in a game of chess. It played millions of games of chess in a, a, a much abbreviated time. And it learned, you know, what are the various openings, the middle game, you know, the end game, et cetera. And so went through all those permutations. So when it played a grandmaster champion, Essentially, it was it had reinforced itself to the point where it was really difficult for it to ever lose. So those are our approaches uh, to, uh, to the machine learning. Now we're going to talk about our approaches to deep learning. And as we'll learn, deep learning is made up of artificial neural networks. And there's, again, um, many more types than these two, but the two primary um, types of neural networks are feed forward and recurrent. But what is an artificial neural network? Much like artificial intelligence, again, we're using sentient being terminology to describe an inanimate object, right? Um, so uh, machines do not have neural networks, right? Um, or, or they, they, what we've done is we've actually made the, the, the computer, we've actually made it similar to the structure of our brain, right? So if you think about our brain, in our brain, we have these these nodes, right? Um, and we essentially are in neurons, and they're connected by synapses. And there's electrical currents that go that travel across those synapses to the the nodes or neurons in our brains, which allow us to do things like I'm doing right now. I'm able to read. I'm speaking uh, to you. I'm moving my hands. Right? Those are all things that are happening in my brain as these electrical currents go from node to node. Um, it's the same in an artificial neural network. What we've done is we've created a neural network where uh, we have essentially these nodes grouped into layers and those layers are connected. And each one of these layers is gonna perform a specific function and that shares that the output to another layer. So let's see how this looks. So we have these neurons and we can see again, these neurons are, are grouped into layers and those layers are connected, or the, those neurons and layers are connected to other neurons and other layers. So what we, um, as we saw before, when we looked at that processing of images, that image, right, of the human face, right? We saw that there was a human face. It was then at the next layer, we determined it was a shape. We then determined that shape were components of a face. Then we looked at, the, we assembled those components of the face into a face and determined was it a rabbit or a human face? And correctly predicted it was a human face. And that's how deep learning is structured over these artificial neural networks. Again, layers containing neurons um, connected to one another, passing data uh, between them. So the feed forward uh, neural network is the, the oldest form of our artificial neural network. Um, it's the simplest form of artificial neural networks. Um, and this is where information flows to and from neurons in a single direction. Um, as we'll learn, there's others that are go uh, two ways, but again, information as we saw kind of in that initial example, the information was flowing from one direction, from input of an image 
all the way through the layers to pr the predictive um, uh, the prediction of a human uh, face. And so, again, we're looking at layers here. And typically, we'll have a visible input layer. So this is exposed to the input. We'll have hidden layers where we're essentially that are not exposed to the input that where the analysis performed. And then we have our output layer. And this is where essentially we output data that is relevant to the problem we're attempt, attempting to uh, solve. And again, we're still, these are um, really intensive um, algorithms compl solving complex problems. But they're less computational expensive than our, our more um, uh, uh, complex and more robust uh, neural networks. So this is what a structure of a feed-forward neural network looks like. As we saw before, we have these neurons. They're in, um, grouped into layers. And uh, in this case, we have, as we were just describing, an input layer. That input layer is then processing information through an input layer, or, excuse me, a hidden layer. And then that that information is then put um, into an output layer. A recurrent neural network is again going to be structured similar to a feed for forward neural network. The difference is is that information can flow back and forth in, in in both directions. So in this case, the neurons are given a sense of memory, um, so they can you calculate. Um, New inputs based on and previous inputs, and we use this, for example, um, when we're doing um, auto completion. Um, when we have this, whether you're using it in Gmail or Microsoft Outlook, or when you're in text messaging, for example, when we type the uh, English uh, word "learn," right? As we type L E A, you'll see the auto complete of R N, right? And so, how does how does uh, the uh, algorithm know that well it, it essentially what happens is is we're going to use this recurrent neural network where it starts to again move the information forward and it says ah i remember that the english language that, that um one of the most common you know there's very few words in the english language that start with the lea um and but it also then learns the context of that word also or the the frequency in which someone's actually using that word and so it actually predicts the next layers. So we use this a lot in natural language processing in the example here, here in LEARN, and we'll see how this is structured. And you can see the difference between, again, we have neurons, those neurons are again grouped in layers, and we have data flow, but you can see at this point, that hidden layer, as we start to process that information, we start to type LEA, and we get to the output, the output says, ah, I remember, this is a word that um, has been typed before, and then goes back to the end layer, and that's where we start to see again the um, auto completion of the words itself. So again, we have um, we've defined the, the primary two types of artificial intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence being that concept. We define machine learning and deep learning. Within machine learning, the approach is being uh, uh, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. And then with deep learning, we have artificial neural networks. And those uh, artificial neural networks, two common ones are feed forward and recurrent, are, although there are, are, are other ones as well. So let's identify our approach to machine and deep learning. What two approaches are used in deep learning? Is it supervised learning, artificial neural networks, reinforcement learning, or recurrent uh, neural networks? And select, we'd like for you to select two here. And just type it in the chat. Great. And the answers, yep, and the answers are coming in and uh, everyone's getting them correct. It's answers two and four. So it is artificial neural networks. And again, uh, one approach um, is a recurrent neural network. Great job, everyone. So now that we've defined again what AI is in machine learning and deep learning and the various approaches, we're gonna talk about how we implement AI for, from a conceptual perspective. So we're going to look at this 
uh, through data science, search engines, natural language processing, or uh, otherwise referred to as NLP, computer vision, and robotics. So let's start with data science. Um, and I want to start by saying that data science and, and artificial intelligence are two separate disciplines, but are often combined. And the reason for that is because artificial intelligence is, is heavily reliant on data, right? We've seen before that we use data to train our artificial intelligence and then our, our AI algorithms and consume data to make um, further predictions. Conversely, data science, we are with, in data science, we're essentially collecting data, data we're, we're calling what we, wrang, we wrangling that data, then we start to engineer it and, and model it out and then use that for data analysis, then we, we expect to extract value from that in, in our presentation and then present that data, right? And so the fact is, is that the amount of data is growing exponentially. Uh, there was a, a, um, a survey performed from some of the largest companies across the world. And, and on average, they had 400 different data sources and a fifth of them had as many as a thousand. So you think about that and you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of data sources. But you think even in a small company, you're gonna have, um, you may have a financial system. Uh, you may have an e-commerce platform. You may have a customer relationship management system, a marketing automation platform. You're gonna have uh, multiple social media cha channels. Etc. You can get easily to ten to you know to a dozen sources of data very quickly, even in the smallest business. So you can see how large businesses, when they have these enter, 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 enterprise resource planning systems, supply chain management systems, talent management systems, HR systems, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, how they can easily get to four hundred sources of data. So with all that data, when we're we're engineering that for use through our data science processes. We're many times using machine learning to help us model that data. So we're doing things to help us to classify that data or cluster that data or otherwise represent that data in, in ways that allow us to, again, to e e more easily analyze it and extract value from it. So again, data science and machine learning, although two separate, again, disciplines still, we're seeing them more and more often being combined. Some applications for data science um, with AI. Um, again, when we're again starting to you know try to interpret large amounts of data, again, AI is really good at essentially taking large amounts of data and making sense of that data. We saw that with the healthcare examples, right? Essentially, we can essentially say, here's a bunch of examples, and here are some features that we know, but let's have the, the algorithm essentially. It's take that information and process it and make some predictive outcomes of that. So, um, and we're seeing this um, in healthcare. We, we talked about the, the um, heart example, but we um, actually IBM paired with the Michael J. Fox Foundation uh, focused on Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease actually progresses in a nonlinear uh, way. Um, so you can't say, hey, someone uh, that has Parkinson's that's diagnosed today is going to be at point A in three years, point B in five years. It just doesn't progress like that. So they've actually paired um, AI uh, with the data from Parkinson's patients, and now they're actually able to predict a more likely path in the progression of Parkinson's. And that just wasn't um, possible with, without the intervention of artificial intelligence. And we're also using this not only in healthcare, but many other industries as well. For example, um, in, um, in e-commerce and online retailing, right? So we're starting to essentially, and you've probably experienced this yourselves, where essentially as a customer, you purchase something and maybe there was a recommendation to, to purchase something else, right? Well, how does it know to recommend that? Well, they, it's recommended based on your purchasing habits, but other purchasing habits of people like you as well. Um, I, I, I enjoy cycling. So if I'm going out and, and buying a pair of cycling shoes, it's likely, even if I was on a large online retailer, not a cycling specific uh, uh, retailer, that they're gonna recommend a pair of socks, right? Well, why did they do that? Well, because people that have bought shoes were likely to buy socks with their new shoes. 
right? So they cannot start to identify patterns. And we see this in our streaming services. And we'll talk more about that in, in other where we have these recommendation engines as well. We also see it in search engines. Um, if you're not familiar how search engines work, uh, when you perform a search, whether using Google, Bing, um, DuckDuckGo, whatever your search engine of choice is, that that uh, search is that not actually going out and crawling the entire web. The actual the search engine provider has already done that. They've gone out and crawled the web, and they've indexed um, those pages in a database. Um, what's interesting is um, even Google has indexed less than 10% of the, the entire web. Um, and, and, and much of that is because a lot of the web is the dark web. And we think of the dark, dark web, we think of this nef nefarious, you know, um, you know, place. And the fact is, is there is a lot of illicit activity that happens in a small uh, minority of the dark web. But the dark web means that essentially it's uh, internet enabled uh, websites or pages, but it means that you have to, you may have to authenticate, right? Like sometimes you'll go to a website and there's, um, you want to download a white paper. Well, you got to put your information in a form to download that white paper. Well, that white paper is now what we call on the dark web, right? It's not accessible um, by without some level of authentication or um, access. So, so Google has essentially indexed as well as Bing, et cetera, indexed essentially with the publicly available web and it indexes that in a database and then we perform a search query we essentially are hitting that index database the results are retrieved from that database and sent to us well in that process we're using artificial intelligence so you think about why do you use uh, a specific uh, a search engine right because it returns the most valuable information to you most efficiently, right? So essentially the efficacy of that search is high, right? And so, and it's AI is helping us do that. So machine learning is essentially, it's helping us and now in the use of deep learning in some cases as well to improve um, the results um, based on that individual's intentions. And again, it can be based on what other people have searched on, what I have searched on, searched on prior, um, right, so if I, and you can see that, right, if you go into Google or whatever your search engine is and you start to type and you've already typed a search, it will start to auto-complete that for you and it, it's going to bring the lowest, um, most likely results back to you based on your previous search and other searches completed by other people as well. And with artificial intelligence, we can now contextualize searches, right? So, uh, for example, um, I just saw this morning that, um, and, and I don't know how many of you follow football, soccer, but um, uh, Liverpool won last night. Um, and so um, if I was to do a search on the Liver Liverpool Football Club, if I was to do a search this morning, the first thing that I would see is last night's score the, uh, of the match, right? If I was actually to perform that search um, uh, tomorrow, um, I'm like, most likely maybe able to see what um, the, the, one of the results that will come back is the match that they have scheduled for this weekend. If I was to perform that saw, search in um, in off period, let's say June or July, I may learn about um, you know their uh, their off season preparation right for the upcoming season. Again, all of that is being contextualized based on again the time of when I'm performing my search. Natural language processing um, is, again, something we engage with each day. Um, so we have, I'm, I'm gonna kind of do the top and bottom first. So there's the ability to analyze text um, and actually to generate text as well. Um, so one of the uh, most powerful, and, and there's now since more powerful um, deep learning algorithms or natural language processing algorithms. But if you look up GPT-3, um, that was open, uh, created by OpenAI and has been um, since uh, licensed by Microsoft. But Google has its um, uh, large uh, natural langu uh, language processing algorithms as well. But if you go and search on them, you can see that they're doing really complex text analysis and also uh, text generation as well. Um, they're also doing a lot of translation, right? You, we can go to websites now. Um, and and uh, and easily tra translate entire website, right? 
a lot of that's all being uh, facilitated by natural language translation. And then we have the ability um, to, to recognize speech, to understand speech, and to generate speech. And just as an example, I'm going to do uh, with Siri here. I'm going to ask Siri what I live um, in a, near Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm going to ask um, Siri what the weather is today. Hello, Siri. What is the weather in Atlanta, Georgia today? Oops, and I had the, the, the sound off. I'm going to do that one more time. Hello, Siri. What is the weather in Atlanta, Georgia today? It's currently cloudy and 57 degrees in Atlanta. Right. So what we just saw uh, Siri um, do for us there, it recognized speech, right, that I was actually speaking to it. It understood what I was saying to it, right? It was it actually understood that I said, "Hey Siri, what is the weather in Atlanta, Georgia today?" And then it was actually able to generate language, right? You heard heard Siri say that it's cloudy and fifty seven degrees today, in and that's Fahrenheit, by the way. Um, so, cloudy and fifty seven degrees Fahrenheit in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia today. So again, that's a, a really great example of. Recognition of speech, understanding of uh, our, of language, and then the ability to generate language as well. So, what are some applications? Um, again, we can see that right with our phones, our our home assistants, etc. Um, and really, our uh, we we're using it in our you know in many of our applications now for autocomplete, whether we're texting, right? We talked about Gmail and Outlook, etc. And it's really the ability to um, examine, you know, language is used in context. And, and, and as you know, um, I'm assuming most of you are native German speakers. The English language um, is a very complex language. Um, and a lot of times we say uh, we have the same word spelled differently, or sometimes the same word that is spelled the same and means it has different meanings. Um, but the, the example is there. Um, so there is, it could be they are. Right, a um, so um, it could be there, like I'm going there to a place, or there being there being possessive. Um, so if I'm saying they're going there, natural language is going to be able to parse that and know that I'm saying they are, and because it's a present participle, a verb ending in ing, and that I'm and that I'm going there, which is a place, which is t-h-e-r-e. -E. So think about the complexity of that. And to be able to understand that, and that's the, the, the level of parsing that we can do with natural language process, um, processing. So we're able to start to do things that we're starting to see. We're able to autocomplete and do more advanced um, uh, computational language. And again, we're, we're even now gotten to the point where um, we can actually, we're using these um, really more advanced natural language processing algorithms, um, where we can actually, um, we've seen people write poetry and write articles. And again, some of them can be nonsensical, but if over time it's getting better and better where it actually can uh, write, um, you know, intelligible um, text um, that is could be useful. Um, so, which is interesting. Um, we also use this um, in classifying the mood of language, right? Think about written product reviews on websites. If you're re reviewing something that's a one through five, one being poor and five being excellent, well, if you get a rating of three, is that good or bad, right? So, and now what you want to do is start to assess what someone's written. And now we're using natural language processing, not only assess the actual text that was written, but the mood of that language as well. And so this allows us to be able to be preemptive or proactive um, with our customers to help increase customer satisfaction as well. Um, computer vision, um, this is our ability to, um, to recognize objects. Um, so um, obviously we're starting to use this um, uh, in recognizing face and facial recognition. Um, it, we'll talk more about that because there's pluses and minuses to that. Uh, able to classify objects, we saw that earlier, right, with our example of the human face. Our ability to generate images. Again, some of the most advanced um, algorithms are, are generating um, actual images now. Our ability to detect motion, um, it, it doing trajectory estimates, estimation, right? So now if you look at all the travel and not only in space, but um, also um, in aeronautics and in other um, 
industries as well. We're starting to estimate the trajectory. Uh, use it in CCTV and video tracking, uh, combined with motion detecting, detection and some um, facial recognition. And in navigation as well, and, and you know, um, probably the most uh, famous examples of that will be in um, autonomous vehicles or near near autonomous vehicles. So, um, in using face identification, um, it's uh, you know. We're starting in facial recognition. I think people know, or it's it's um, it's somewhat controversial because these systems aren't as good yet as they need to be, um, and so um, there's um, it, they have been outlawed in, in in many places in the use um, in policing, but we are using it for many other um, capabilities. So um, I haven't flown in, in a while, uh, but the last time I flew um, internationally prior to COVID, um, I actually. Um, was uh, it, when I was uh, leaving the Atlanta airport, they used facial recognition to um, confirm that, that my face was also the face that it was the uh, the photo on my um, passport. Um, so we're starting to use it in those cases to, in that case, it was to, to reduce the onboarding time um, through um, to get on the plane. Um, and but we're also using this in, in other cases, um, again, computer vision for uh, our, again, uh, autonomous driving. Um, and again, we don't have, we have very few instances of true autonomous um, driving today. So Tesla, for example, there's a scale of one to five, five being actual autonomous vehicles. And in Tesla, for example, is a two right now. Um, so if that gives you any indication. So there are better examples, um, but really the ability for a, a are to truly drive autonomously on open roads, um, although there is examples of it being done, um, we don't have yet fully autonomous vehicles. But what they're doing is they're essentially again using computer vision. These they have cameras. They're intaking that information and instantaneously, near instantaneously anyway, making decisions based on um, that information. Again, that's all using computer vision. Um, and robotics, um, by definition, robotics are using some level of artificial intelligence. Um, you can see here the difference between the Mars rover and a drone. Both act in a physical world, but the Mars rover is autonomous, where a drone is being um, manipulated or controlled by a human being. So Mars, the Mars rover is a robot, the RC drone is, is not a drone, or I'm sorry, it's not a robot. Um, because it, it's, it does not operate autonomously. So some applications um, for um, robotics. Um, we see robotics, I mentioned um, that one of the earliest uses on an auto manufacturing um, floor. And, and, that's, and those are typically um, an industrial, what we call industrial robots. And we use industrial robots um, extensively now. Um, so if you go into um, you know, especially large manufacturers and most large manufacturing environments, you will see industrial robots. I use the example of Amazon and their distribution warehouses uh, where they're using robotics. Um, you see it in other, you know, transportation, manufacturing, et cetera. Um, again, and this is where robots are um, uh, trained through, typically through reinforcement learning, as we learned earlier, to do a very specific um, task. And that's versus a general purpose robot, right? And we think about um, general purpose robots. We think about um, you know the robots being able to um, move, um, if not like humans, similar to humans, and be able to have you know typically will have appendages, arms, etc., and 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 be able to do a multitude of things. Um, if you haven't ever seen, there, there's a um, a company out of the U.S., Boston Scientific. Um, that actually has these dancing robots and it just shows the complexity of movements that robots are able to do. Um, so you, please feel free to Google that, um, but you'll see that um, it's like a two to three minute um, dance routine that they do. It took them 18 months to program them to do that, but it, what they're attempting to do is again, essentially um, through reinforcement learning is have these robots be able to do more and more complex tasks. Um, so when they go to do, you know, go into a, a um, you know, an office setting or an industrial setting, um, they're able to do things that mimics to some extent what humans do. Um, 
And again, reinforcement learning as we learned is common for robots. You know, the example here of shaking the person's hands, right? Um, if they extend their hand, uh, a robot does and a, a person grasps it and shakes it, the next time they engage a per person, they'll do the same thing. If they reach their hand out and there's a cat and the cat doesn't grab its hand and to shake it, the next time it engages the cat, it won't do that. Um, and again, robotic robots now are also um, starting to leverage um, not only uh, reinforcement learning to perform actions, but also some uh, natural language capabilities as well as computer vision. Um, and again, that Boston Scientific, if, if you go and search on that further, you'll see that how they're actually using computer vision to enable those ro robots to be able to navigate, um, again, uh, more complex settings. So uh, let's just uh, take a step back here and, and discuss our AI implementations and um, what's your company most likely to use? Um, again, it could be um, any of these numbers. Um, it could be that they would be likely to use it in data science, um, with search engines, NLP, uh, computer vision, or robotics. And again, if, if your company's not using AI or doesn't expect to in the near future, I just um, put the one in you think would be most interesting for your company to use. Yeah, we're seeing the answers across the board, um, and, and 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 that's typical. Um, you know, what I would say is most companies now are starting to use um, are, are are again amassing large volumes of data, and so are, are employing data scientists, and those data scientists are using uh, machine learning more often in their modeling uh, processes. Um, Again, search engines are commonplace, um, whether we're consumers of those using, you know, the Googles, Bings, DuckDuckGo's of the world, et cetera, um, or companies um, uh, developing uh, search engines um, into um, their various platforms. Uh, natural language processing, that's, um, I, I will say natural language processing is highly concentrated now in um, some of the largest tech companies and research um, uni uh, universities. Um, but we do expect as it becomes more affordable um, and, and less resource intensive that it will be utilized or developed by more organizations. Um, same with computer vision um, and robotics again is, um, you know, are, is widely utilized now, uh, whether people are manufacturing robot, robots or not, they're definitely utilizing them. Great job, everyone. Thanks for participating. <laughs> Now we're going to talk about some of the benefits of artificial intelligence, then uh, as some of the associated challenges. Um, and if you're a business person, this is, um, I, I always say this is probably the most important slide in, in the entire presentation. Um, I think many times, um, and I always say this, you know, you, you have a, a business leader, CEO, or someone in the C-suite that's flying on a plane and they're uh, reading online or one of the, um, the, the airplane magazines about another company deploying a technology and all of a sudden they come back to the office like, hey, we have to use artificial intelligence. And, you know, artificial intelligence is like any technology, right? Um, just because um, you have a hammer doesn't mean you have, you know, nails to, to actually hammer in, right? Um, so you have to find the appropriate use for it. So not getting caught up in the wow factor. So like any, um, and we've distilled this down. There's obviously more questions that you would want to ask, but you would want to start by asking yourself, what's the business value you're trying to capture with artificial intelligence, right? And then do you have the information that you'll need, need to be able to derive the insights to deliver this value, right? So I, maybe we want to increase sales, but maybe we haven't been tracking our sales data, right? So we don't have the information to be able to use artificial intelligence to drive business value because we're lacking um, the, the, the data that will drive that those insights. And what resources will you need, right? Those resources being data, computational resources. Um, again, much of AI is employed, deployed in the cloud today, not exclusively, but primarily. Um, and also resources, right? We talked about that in the beginning of our presentation. 
And those resources aren't only technical resources, but also people in the business, project managers, product managers, uh, senior leaders, uh, individuals in the lines of business who may be stakeholders um, and their ability to influence and make the correct decisions about um, what we're trying to achieve, but also interpreting the data once available. So again, um, it would, I always say that if you leave with anything from as a business person from this presentation, it's really uh, with artificial intelligence, understanding you're trying to drive business value, you need, you're gonna have to have some insights that you can interpret that will drive the business value and you need to have resources in place that will pro provide the information that then, then allow you to derive the value. Um, there's many economic benefits um, from artificial intelligence. Um, Netflix, for example, saved over a billion dollars in revenue from saved subscriptions. What was the primary driver? Some will say, well, they have their own um, content now. And that's part of it. But it started with the recommendation engine, right? So it was the ability for Netflix to say, hey, you, or, and again, this is any streaming service now, but using Netflix as an example, is that you enjoyed this series or this movie, and here's another one like it. And, you know, and I'm a, a Netflix subscriber, and, and I'm, I'm a great example of someone that said, you know, you know, why would I continue to pay my, you know, 14 US dollars a month for Netflix? And it's because, you know, again, they do have some original content that I enjoy, but a lot of it's because I watched a documentary last weekend about this um, alpinist and they recommended another movie and I added that to my queue to watch. And when I finish that one, they'll probably add another one and I'll, uh, you know, and uh, they'll recommend another one and I'll probably add that to my queue as well. So a great example of recommendation engines powered by AI that help facilitate a subscription um, business model. Um, Amazon has reduced and has continued to reduce their oper operational costs due to automation. Um, so if you go into a, a Amazon warehouse, and again, you can Google this online, you can see the level of automation. Um, I talked about the robots going up and down the aisles, um, but they're using it in sorting and numerous, numerous other activities as well that where they're automating processes to um, reduce uh, time for delivery, but also uh, operational costs along the way. And what we'll see is that um, it's expected by 2030 that our global gross domestic product or GDP, um, AI may grow it by as much as 14%. Um, it truly is, you know, some are saying that AI it will be as transformative as the internet was, as electricity was. It truly has that potential um, if we realize the full potential of the technologies. Um, Chatbots is a great example. Um, has saved companies billions of dollars. Um, if you're not familiar with a chatbot, um, it, it's, you know, it's when you go on a website and a chat window pops up um, some of those are manned by humans and others are um, essentially will take you through a series of questions and eventually you may get to a human, but maybe not. Maybe the chat bot will answer your question from a knowledge base. Um, and again, so that's helped to do two things. Um, it's helped to increase customer satisfaction because we're able to get answers more rapidly. Um, it, but also it allows our customer service representatives to uh, deal with higher level uh, challenges and not that, you know, I forgot my password or where do I purchase, you know, this good, et cetera. Those are being able to be facilitated by chatbots. Um, and we see chatbots not only um, in the use of, um, uh, on the internet, but also voice um, activated as well. Um, huge time saving benefit. Um, I, I, you know, one thing about AI, um, well, I'm going to, a couple things that are, are, are outside the scope of this course, but I'll, I'll share here is first with artificial intelligence, we've achieved what we call artificial narrow intelligence. This is the ability for an AI algorithm to do a single task really well. So a natural language processing, uh, uh, even the most advanced natural language processing algorithms, they're able to potentially uh, do translation or to generate text or to um, classify uh, images, et cetera. But they can't do all of those. And so you have multiple um, algorithms doing each of those. And they, um, and although they'd be able to do that, they couldn't be able to um, 
it, it assess, you know, whether it's um, warm or cold outside because they don't understand warm or cold. Uh, they wouldn't be able to do all the things that we can do as humans. We can do a multitude of things. Algorithms do one thing and they do it what really well. The other thing is they can do things that we can do as humans in, you know, as, as a snap of a finger. Um, so they, they're very good at synthesizing new information quickly and much faster than humans because they can, can uh, essentially process a lot more information in a more rapid fashion. But again, they can't do the multitude of things that we do. And all they can do is, is what they're trained to do, which is make a, a prediction. So, but with that, we can have algorithms that, for example, I was, um, there's a, uh, a company that can do audits uh, of um, expense reports. And, and so typically in a uh, public company, a, a, a third party a tax consultancy will come in and audit all of your information, include your expense reports. And in a large company, that could be literally, you know, hundreds of hours of billings for that consultancy. Now there's actually AI that can actually go through and audit those expense reports. It's literally in a matter of hours and in some cases minutes. Um, and so again, it can't do the multitude of things that that tax consultant can do, right? That person can go on to do other things, but it can do that one thing really well. So this actually save this save times means you know allows for more productivity, right? We as humans can you know focus on those higher cognitive tasks, right? The less repetitive tasks, and we'll leave the more repetitive rote tasks to artificial intelligence. And again, we looked at you know Amazon, their reduced operational um, costs, right? So the ability for you know something that took an hour for a human to do takes you know minutes um, for a um, again a, a AI algorithm to complete. Problem solving benefits again, um, anything that's easily reducible, AI is very good at doing. Um, so again, I talked about that the, the ability to you know audit expense reports. Um, the same thing with um, the ability um, to determine fraudulent activity. Um, right, a it, essentially a human would have to sift through you know large volumes of information to be able to determine if something's fraudulent or not. Where a AI has been trained to do that. Um, and so they're able to easily more easily discern whether something's fraudulent activity. Um, so some examples of this are data centers and the use of um, energy, right? Data centers consume large volumes of energy. So how do we essentially um, you make the most efficient use of the energy that's available to us? Um, in marketing, ad campaigns, right? Um, so if we go out on social media, um, how is a, um, a, a ad campaign targeted to us? Well, it uses artificial intelligence to do that. I mentioned I enjoyed cycling, right? So if I'm following certain individuals or in some cases um, use with a third use of third party cookies, um, which are starting to go away, but um, I would, you know, search on, um, you know, cycling shoes. And the next thing I would see in my, you know, uh, social media feed, I would see an advertisement for cycling shoes, right? So the ability to essentially to target that again through the use of artificial intelligence um, as well as some basic web technologies. Um, and also, you know, uh, we start to use this in uh, making decisions within our business, right? How do we identify and potentially minimize wasteful spending? Um, again, an artificial intelligence is able to go through using that expense report example, right? Maybe what they discern is that we're spending, you know, a lot of money um on uh on soft drinks on you know um people purchasing a coke or a pepsi or whatever their drink of choice is um and maybe we say that soft drinks are no longer expensive items right and I, i'm just making up an example um uh, maybe it's coffee whatever it is right um and so all of a sudden that spending is reduced and, and that allowing that company to be more profitable or potentially invest that in other areas in the business um, error reduction, um, you know, we as humans, we like to think we're infallible, but we're not. Uh, we make mistakes um, and sometimes we make this because of lack of well-defined procedures. Other times we um, haven't been able to, to learn what we need to learn to, to, to do the, the task appropriately. Um, we have cognitive biases, right? Sometimes we don't enjoy doing certain work, 
work um, and we do it um, at a lesser um, quality level than we do other work. Uh, cognitive impair impairments, right? Maybe we're not able to, to be able to understand what we need to to perform the work. And AI um, can compensate for these mistakes, right? Um, an example is pilots, right? Um, you, if you follow the airline industry at all, you probably know pilots use autopilot often, including um, they, yeah, you know, the, the takeoff or, or the landing of planes, um, um, but also in, in troubleshooting. Um, so we can now look at AI, to, you know, in those highly stressful situations to help recommend, you know, what um, it, you know, may be the um, uh, appropriate uh, uh, next task to perform. Um, we're also starting to see this now in uh, medicine, um, so in, in imaging. Uh, so, whether that's an MRI, CAT scan, X-ray, um, a AI can look at literally millions and millions of images. So, you can think about the, you know, the most um, experienced uh, radiologist or person, you know, that reads um, these images often, they, they would never be able to, in their lifetime, be able to um, review the number of images that an AI can in a much shorter period of time. So, AI may be able to find you know, a potential early stage disease state sooner. Obviously, we still want an individual involved in the interpretation of that process, but again, reducing the, the mistakes. And we see this also in quality checks of, you know, manufacturing companies are now using AI um, as a first line um, quality check, because again, they're being able to see small fissures or other um, imperfections in products um, that could lead to um, accidents, et cetera, prior and then moving that on to human. So again, um, there's a, uh, a number of great opportunities here. We're also now starting to use AI and software vulnerabilities. So GitHub, which is a, a large third party repository um, now by Microsoft, um, they're using that to um, identify software vulnerabilities in the public code. Um, people can also um, purchase that for their, to, to um, evaluate their private code as well. Uh, human comfort, comfort benefits. Um, uh, you know, the fact is, is that, um, you know, we, AI may allow us to, to, um, to may, AI may perform the majority of our dull repetitive tasks so we can start to focus on higher level activities that, you know, the work that we enjoy. Um, so it really can be that transformative and, um, you know, it could even potentially um, lead to a reduction in work hours um, and uh, for individuals as well. Um, and additional benefits, um, AI is, um, we started at the top of the, our presentation, can be applied to really to any industry. Um, it's creating new industries. Um, it's providing us with business um, insights into our current business, as well as opportunity to extend our business. Um, we're using it to help um, better personalize education. Um, and really any task that takes on large amounts of data um, is, is, could be uh, truly benefited um, from artificial intelligence. With that, um, before uh, before we go to our next session, we'll do another uh, poll here. So before implementing an AI solution, what are the three questions you should consider? So again, it's multiple choice and there's three correct answers here. So um, should you consider what is the value? What is NLP? What are the insights or what are the resources? Right. And the, the correct three answers here is, um, if you remember on that one slide, it's what's the value, right? What's the business value that we're trying to extract? What are the insights that we need to drive that value? And what are the resources that will provide us the insights, right? The information to make the informed decisions. Great job. So we're gonna talk about the challenges of artificial intelligence now. And we're gonna start, uh, we, we alluded to this earlier, but the ethics, ethics of AI, right? Um, and there, there's some questions to ask, right? How does machines, how do they treat human beings, right? They don't have the 
uh, moral compass or the, the understanding of the ethical norms that we do as uh, humans, right? So essentially, how do we ensure that the AI that we're developing is, again, not going to cause any harm um, and is responsible? So um, there's a lot of questions around this. Again, um, there's uh, the EU, um, I know, is uh, has begun um, to uh, write some uh, a regulation uh, that, again, would be similar to potentially GDPR that would help regulate um, uh, AI. Um, again, they're attempting to do it to not to um, impact innovation they still want uh you know the the innovative um, potential of ai um, but to ensure the protection of people so ai doesn't grow to be um you know harmful towards individuals um and so uh, as businesses we need to understand this as well and ethics it's you know it's interesting because um this, this is um really aimed at humans but then the next which is biases biases can be um, again, aimed at humans, but also you can have biased data that isn't specific to humans as well. So again, we don't want to do anything that's biased against humans based on, um, you know, their their person, right? Um, race, uh, religion, uh, cultural background, um, gender, um, age, um, location, et cetera, right? Th those are all things that, um, you know, it, it may be taken into um, consideration for some reasons, you know, if you are, for example, um, if you're, you know, you provide baby products, right? You, you want to make sure you're, are, you know, advertising them to, you know, um, people of, you know, typ typical people of, you know, parenting age, right? Not to a teenager, for example, a young teenager anyway. Um, so, um, so there's times where that's appropriate, but there's times where, again, what we don't want to do is bias against individuals. But it's also, you want to make sure that it's the, that the data that you're using to train your uh, AI is not biased either. So if I gave you a post-class survey and I said, hey, this was a good, great, or the best ever class that you've ever taken, I didn't give you an opportunity to say that it was fair or poor. So when I start to, when I ask those leading questions, and those surveys, essentially, I'm going to not get essentially the, the full scope of data that I need to be able to evaluate to make further decisions on how we present this class. So, uh, and that could be the example with e-commerce data, right? If you look at, you know, past sales, I'm, I'm drinking from a water bottle that happens to be green. Um, so, if, if, you know, if you look at green uh, glass water bottle sales were 75% last month, you may say, hey, we need to just be manufacturing more green water bottles when in actuality, your black and red water bottles uh, were, out, um, were out of stock, right? So we need to essentially to understand that our data, um, what, you know, what our data consists of to make sure it's not biased because the algorithms themselves won't understand that that data is biased. It's only gonna make decisions based on the data that we present it. Um, there's also privacy issues. Um, so again, an algorithm doesn't know if I start to piece this data together. So if I take, you know, Jeff Felice, you know, um, somewhere outside of Atlanta, Georgia, of a certain age, and at this address, et cetera, it's starting to identify me as a person. It, it's identifying me as a person in a specific lo location of a specific age, um, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, we're we're getting into where it's now. Um, I, you know, providing my personal identifiable information, my PII, which again may allow someone to track me to be able to be able to, you know, perform fraudulent activity with my information and et cetera, right? So we, and, and again, AI doesn't know that it's doing that now. So we again need to make sure that it's when it's completing its analysis and doing its predictions, it's not doing things like linking individuals, you know, again, we use obfuscated information that a healthcare, you know, in that healthcare example with a patient ID as opposed to a patient name, but we don't want them to put forth that patient name, right, or location, et cetera. So again, we need to be aware of this as well. And legal issues, right? Um, the, you know, as I alluded to, the fact is, is that we don't have regulations in place today to uh, fully regulate artificial intelligence. So um, these are, um, we have some under development, 
Um, again, depending where you are in the world. Um, again, I, you know, I'll use the US example. We're uh, lagging behind, I know, the EU and other parts of the world. Um, so, again, I uh, need to understand that. Again, some existing laws may apply to the use of these technologies like data privacy um, and uh, some other laws as well as, you know, employee and customer safety. Um, and some uh, biases, again, against protected late, uh, protected classes, um, displacement of human labor, labor again, AI, is, 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 is especially as you ex extend that to robotics, et cetera, um, has the potential to really, again, as we saw earlier, move some jobs and um, change jobs and move some towards obsolescence. So we need to make sure that, again, um, we're not negatively impacting, you know, uh, individuals or large swaths of, of the population. <laughs> And some additional issues. Um, it's hard to collect large data sets. There are more and more uh, data sets that are available, um, some open source, others that are um, on a fee basis. Um, but we, we need to make sure that we're collecting large data sets that are, are um, again, don't contain certain biases, um, don't, um, again, uh, start to uh, expose personal information, et cetera. Um, so, uh, we, in doing that, it's, um, again, not easy um, to collect those data sets. Um, current computing infrastructure may be inadequate. Again, especially for the most advanced deep learning algorithms, um, it, you know, there's very few companies that can essentially um, could host a GPT-3 type uh, 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 algorithm. Um, it's just the, the computational power is immense, um, the, the, the data uh, that's utilized, um, et cetera. So, uh, e but even as we get into um, uh, smaller uses of uh, deep learning and machine learning, again, you still have to have um, more computing power um, to develop in uh, these uh, algorithms um, than um, is available to some organizations. Uh, training personnel on AI is challenging, um, so artificial intelligence, although people generally think they understand what it is, as, as we're learning today, there's definitely many layers to it, and we're still at the knowledge level and not, you know, we're not selecting algorithms, training them, and implementing them, um, there's, and that's, you know, vastly more, more complex. Obviously, something, you know, knowledge and skills that people can learn, um, but we need, we need to be training people to do this. Uh, labeling data for supervised learning can be difficult. Um, so we talked about labeling earlier. Um, we did that at, that in the healthcare example um, with labeling the outcome, but then it was very simple binary, um, yes or no, whether someone had heart disease, um, but it starts to become more difficult as our data sets become larger and more complex. Um, AI makes decisions but without explaining why, right? Um, so we, that's one of the things that we are starting to work on is explainability, the trustworthiness of um, the predictions that our AI is making. Um, and negative consequences can have an exponential effect, right? So we're using AI in hiring processes in some of the largest organizations across the world. And these, you know, um, AI um, algorithms are imperfect. Humans are imperfect in that process as well. So maybe we were training, you know, um, one one uh, less optimal um, process off for another, but again, we have to understand that it's it's not that um, AI is imperfect at this point as well. If we identify the challenges of AI, what issues may be the most impacted by regulations such as GDPR? Is it ethics, privacy, legal, or safety? And although all of these answers are correct, the, the two most right answers uh, for, from a GDPR uh, would be uh, privacy and legal. Um, and uh, although ethics and safety are, are appropriate answers as well. Uh, we're moving on into the last section, um, which is our business use cases for AI. So um, we're going to talk about a couple um, functional or organizational um, uses uh, for AI, and then we'll move into some uh, uh, industry or sector-based um, uh, uses of it. Um, we do have case studies um, that you can see, and what I would say is that 
if you have an interest in any specific area, just um, you know, search, do an internet search, um, and you'll find a number of examples of, uh, of the use of AI as well. But from a sales and marketing perspective, we're starting to use it in our um, forecasting of our, uh, of our business. Um, so, um, and there's ways that we're doing this that are making it not only predictive, but prescriptive as well. And we're using um, a number of um, different techniques to do that. Um, as well, um, we're using it in, um, to optimize pricing. Um, so, uh, such a thing as dynamic pricing. So, for example, if you go um, to purchase an airline ticket, that, that literally that t the price of that ticket will change based on the um, day of the week, the time of the day, um, the the volume of uh, uh, people or, or that have already purchased that are already on that um, on you know that same route, maybe that same plane, et cetera. All of that is essentially involved in dynamic pricing. A lot, a lot of large online retailers use this as well. Um, so literally, a, like Amazon will change prices millions of times over the course of a short period of time across all the products that are available based on dynamic pricing. Again, it's based on um, again uh, inventory levels. Um, you know. Uh, the, the timing uh, the, of the day, the day of the week, um, are we are you moving into a period of where there's seasonality, et cetera? All those things um, are determining pricing. Uh, targeted advertising, we talked a little bit about that earlier, right? Um, we're getting to more and more targeted advertising. There's pluses and minuses with that. Um, you know, some of it's at the echo chamber, we're only seeing more of what we expect to see. But in some ways, right, it's reducing the noise and we get to see things that are more um, aligned with our interests. Um, and this is moving not only to new media, but also you know, to traditional media like television as well. Um, we saw that with recommendation engines, right? Um, and we talked about recommendations engines in the context of, um, of Netflix, but we also are using this um, in our um, everyday commerce as well. Um, search engine capabilities, right? Being able to bring back um, more relevant um, information, um, especially when we do this on our own sites, our commerce sites, et cetera. Um, using natural language processing to identify customer attitudes, right? Um, doing this um, not only, um, as I, we talked about earlier, the mood of a, a review, but potentially um, in, uh, in real time as well as we're talking to individuals um, on the phone. Um, and also, uh, we're uh, using this um, to help us, you know, in our marketing processes to improve lead scoring, right? Um, if you would visit a website, typically most organizations have a marketing automation platform that are starting to gauge your level of engagement with their brand. Um, and so they're starting to essentially pull data insights from your web browsing. They may be then linking that to your behaviors with that brand. And engagement on social media, et cetera. So all of that again be empowered by artificial intelligence. Um, finance and economics. Um, so uh, we've talked a little bit about um, the uh, use of chatbots um, in customer service, right? Think about now when you call or when you're online. Again, typically you're going through a series of questions, and you may get to an answer without engage, engaging with a human being. Or if you engage with a human being, you're um, pointed to the, the correct department, right? So if I'm calling about my payment card and potential fraudulent activity, I'm pointed to the fraud department and not just a general customer service agent. Um, so, and we're also using um, artificial neural networks to identify fraudulent act actions, right? So um, prior to COVID, I traveled frequently, but I've never traveled to Brazil. I don't stay in high ends, uh, usually hotels or resorts, and I, you know, I, I get a modest um, rental car. So if there's, you know, someone purchased, you know, several tickets to Brazil, staying at a high end resort and had a, a luxury vehicle, um, it's uh, it's likely going to, you know, it's going to the ANN is going to identify that this is not typical activity on my credit card and flag that. Right, that's an extreme example, but it's those nuanced examples that a, that artificial neural networks are much better at, at, at identifying than humans are. Um, 
we're using it for regulatory compliance, right? So organizations and, and you know financial organizations can comply with the numerous regulations that they have to comply with. Um, we're also starting to use this for financial advice, right? Our financial advisors trying to maximize the investments of their investors are starting to use um, data um, that in, in predictions from artificial intelligence to do that. Um, credit score accuracy. Um, we got to be careful with this um, because uh, we're also using this in um, banking and finance where we're using AI to determine who can receive home and auto loans um, and other types of business loans, et cetera. Um, and so it's getting better, but there's still, it's again, infallible at this point. Um, so, but if we recognize that we can improve on it and eventually improve and enhance credit scores. So um, we truly, um, people that are, are capable of paying back a loan have access to um, various types of loans. Um, healthcare, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. We talked to you know, numerous examples throughout um, but again, um, AI um, holds great promise um, in the um, healthcare industry, um, whether it's in diagnostics, um, whether it's in treatments, um, whether it's helping to um, uh, with scheduling um, in other uh, you know procedures and tasks, et cetera. Throughout, um, we are using um, AI extensively in healthcare. Um, the same in manufacturing, uh, we, we've talked about the use of robotics. Um, so um, again, um, not only uh, performing those you know, dull and repetitive tasks that could lead to injury in humans, but also the most dangerous and difficult tasks as well. Um, I talked about the um, use of AI and quality assurance and, and to um, identify defects. Um, again, um, a human eye may be able not to discern the, the um, you know, most minute or smallest um, defect, which a AI is able to do. Um, we use it in our supply chain processes. We've actually worked with a company um, in some of the CERT Nexus program that is um, furthering their supply chain management system through the use of AI, um, right? And we, we're, you know, we've experienced this globally a little bit with our supply chain, um, you know, get everything from raw material extraction to, um, the development of components and the assembly of those, and then you know, getting those to distribution, you know, warehouses and onto you know retailers and consumers, um, and so using more AI to facilitate that um, to, along the whole chain, right? So uh, removing waste, um, improving cash flows, and um, uh, re uh, and uh, etc. It's also we're using in our designs of our products. Um, we're able to use uh, doing a technique called or, or digital twinning. So we're with a digital twin of an environment, a physical environment. We're able to run through what if scenarios um, of a, whether it's a product or how a machine or piece of equipment will operate, et cetera. Um, so again, using AI more and more in our manufacturing industries. Uh, transportation. Um, right, uh, obviously, you know, there's been a lot of talk about self-driving, um, you know, trucks and cars. Um, uh, we use, um, and again, um, just so, you know, although, again, we're working towards that, um, there's no vehicle that's been approved at level five as of yet, which again, as we talked about earlier, is that highest level of autonomous um, capabilities. Um, so again, we're working towards it. Um, you know, the good and bad of that, um, you know, but um, it's, you know, it's expected to take, you know, a number of years, right? Especially as most of us are still driving cars. How does an autonomous vehicle work in a, an environment where um, we have more people driving cars and more people on bikes and, you know, pedestrians, et cetera. And, you know, again, we start to talk about those ethical choices. You know, do you hit a cyclist or a pedestrian, right? Um, it, you know, it, a car would may have to make that choice. and we wouldn't want a car to make that choice yet. So, um, but we also use it in our ride sharing services, our e-hailing services um, to uh, attempt to make more efficient use of those, uh, those services that are available to us. Um, in our public transportation, we're starting to use it from a scheduling perspective. Um, so um, we actually have, especially those that um, are uh, less um, bound by rail. Um, so when we talk about, um, uh, Buses, mini buses, et cetera, um, having those um, routed to where people need to go um, based on a specific time of day. Um, 
And then uh, you were also using this in, again, our piloting systems um, in, in, in the air as well, um, as well as determining, um, again, routing of planes and um, uh, in, in flight paths, uh, et cetera, uh, to maximize uh, both time and fuel um, while in flight. <laughs> Uh, IT and cybersecurity, uh, we're using this to help reduce, um, hopefully, the number of cyber incidents. Unfortunately, the cyber criminals also have access to artificial intelligence and in, in their, attempt, their uh, attempts to use it as well. Uh, but we're doing everything from um, phishing, right? How do uh, we essentially um, identify potentially uh, phishing email and sequester that so it, it doesn't get into a person's inbox? Um, we're using it. Um, as I talked about in software development, right? So it's uh, tried to uh, reduce uh, software vulnerabilities. Um, we're doing it in um, the behavioral analysis and the behavioral analysis on our network. Um, so the amount of activity um, in our network is is it um, in alignment with with our expectations? If not, is it someone you know is it a potential denial of service attack or is it something else? Um, so we're also using it um, if an incident does recur in our response process or disaster recovery to ensure business continuity as well. In additional use cases, um, again, we talked a little about chat bots, um, uh, also uh, in data visualization, right? And to essentially enable greater insights. We talked about that with data science. One thing we didn't talk about was um, the ability to help those with disabilities. Um, so we're seeing this today, um, you know, with computer vision, enabling those that uh, are, are lacking um, vision or the ability to um, process language um, or uh, may have physical disabilities, uh, inability to speak, allowing them to speak. I think Stephen Hawking, the UK physicist, is probably the most famous example of that. Um, but there's that's more commonplace now. Um, and so we're seeing again AI um, and the use of um, robotics um, allowing for prosthetics and, and other uh, capabilities that we haven't um, been able to, to enjoy in the past. Um, we talked about the hiring processes. Um, and we're also using um, AI in the project management. Um, and IoT is, is closely paired with artificial intelligence now, where IoT generates again huge volumes of data. And we're starting to use AI to better determine what data to collect um, and then again our interpretation or analysis of that data as well. Um, so as, as we start to look at the future of AI, um, you know, AI is going to continue to revolutionize not only business but our personal lives and you know probably society at large, right? It is again holds the potential um, to, to be that transformative. And, and one thing that again goes beyond the scope of this course, but we talk about is that we've achieved what we call artificial narrow intelligence or ANI. Um, this is the ability for um, uh, artificial intelligence to do a singular thing really well. Um, some think we'll achieve artificial general intelligence. This is where a computer um, would have equivalent um, capabilities to a human. So that's why we're calling it general intelligence. Some say we may reach that in the next five to 10 years, some say never. And then there's artificial super intelligence, and that's where a computer would have intelligence greater than humans. Um, and that's what we see many times in uh, you know, the dystopian you know, type of movies um, that feature AI, where there's a supercomputer that's smarter than humans. Um, and some say that you know, will always continue to be science fiction. But I share that because even just with ANI and the limited, um, and when I say limited, you know, it, AI is, in, it is, is ubiquitous today, but it has so much more potential, even at, a, at the ANI level, that it is truly transformative. So it's going to, um, you know, have a big impact in our, our business and personal settings. Um, and, you know, so we'll start to see, you know, hopefully, you know, streamline business processes. Um, improved um, opportunities for individuals that, you know, maybe potentially the reduction of those, you know, rote or repeatable tasks so we can focus on, you know, those um, business um, challenges that require high, higher cognitive thought. Um, you know, we'll also see, a, you know, AI help us to grow, you know, hopefully grow our relationships with our customers, um, you know, provide more targeted messaging, offerings, recommendations, et cetera. 
Um, obviously, you know, those individuals with AI skills are going to be more sought after, right? Um, right now, for every four uh, AI engineering jobs, there's less than three uh, qualified people to fill those jobs. Um, and as we move that out into product and project management, you know, various areas of the business, the C-suite, et cetera, et cetera, again, uh, we, have, we don't have enough people with enough knowledge as of yet. Um, so again, great potential for AI. Um, we again need to make sure that we're using it in a responsible way, um, with you know uh, qualified individuals, sol you know solving the right problems. But again, it, it holds great potential for us. 